I think the Keyboard Warrior Inquisition might be after me. But to explain how I got myself into this pickle, we need to go back a couple of weeks. So yeah, I uploaded a video of Figueredo's Rule 14 against Polearms with a greatsword. And that thing kind of exploded with a lot of people yelling at me that rule number one of combat is that you should never spin. Well, rules have exceptions. And although I did expect people to have a little bit of resistance to that notion, I wasn't quite expecting this. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! Hello everyone, it's Oscar at the Virtual Fechula here, and today we really need to talk about great swords and pikes. Because both of these weapons are absolutely great, and therefore it's really such a shame that these weapons are so badly misunderstood generally. To be fair, it's not really a surprise, because both of these weapons are pretty hard to get your hands on, and therefore most people really reason from secondary sources, or even just pop culture. And another thing, um, this very much strays into the which weapon is better territory, so that would explain some of the emotional involvement of people as well. But that said, I think it would be a really good idea to really dive into this subject a little bit deeper and try and figure out what's going on with Figueredo's technique here. So, circular footwork or greatsword, is it a win or is it a sin? Let's go and find out. Let's first have a look at what the manual actually says. Don Diogo Gomez de Figueredo wrote his manual on rapier and greatsword in the early 17th century, and he was building on an already well-established tradition of Iberian greatsword that dated back all the way to the beginning of the 16th century. His manual is built up of 16 techniques called rules or reglas, and each rule has a simple version and a composite counterpart. The simple version is, well, simpler, and the composite version is rather more difficult to do. So usually that means they require a greater range of motion or just more skill overall. Rule 14 is against thrown weapons and two-handed polearms, such as pikes for instance. And the simple version starts with your left foot in front and your montante in front of you at an obtuse angle. Now if the pike then thrusts at you, you try and deflect it downwards to the side, while also at the same time making a diagonal big step forward towards the right side. And that means that you strike the pike down, then continue the motion in a circular fashion, and then getting yourself ready with that spin to then land the cut from your right side at your opponent. The composite version basically has you do the same, but then starting with the right foot in front. But there's also a very interesting variation to that, where you do not use a spin, but instead you start with the right foot in front, beat down the pike as it's coming towards you, and then turn that motion into an overrun thrust, and then run directly forward. This looks a lot faster and less exposed, doesn't it? So why do the spinning? As a general rule, it's not a very good idea to expose your back to your opponent while fighting, so generally speaking, spinning moves are a no-no. But where there is a general rule, there's also going to be exceptions, and I think this is one of them. Yes, directly deflecting the pike might actually mean you go forward faster, but there's also a couple of downsides to it. For instance, you, if since you start with your right foot in front, uh, you're going to be solely relying on the parry to keep you safe in the pike. If that parry isn't quite spot on, you're still going to get hit. By contrast, the simple rule doesn't just deflect the pike, but by using that rightwards diagonal step, you also get your body away from the path that the pike is traveling towards you meaning that if you do not quite get the perfect parry off, you're still going to be safe. Beating the pike like that down does mean that your sword will carry quite a lot of momentum, and that moment, trying to reverse that momentum going forward again is actually pretty difficult. So usually, at that situation, it's a lot faster to just continue the momentum in a circular motion, meaning that you are spinning. And after you're done with that, doing your full 360, you're quite ready to, again, get yourself ready to strike down at your opponent. But in this situation, I think, if you really want to make sure that your parry is going to be fully safe, then spinning with a greatsword does actually make a little bit of sense. What if they try walking backwards? What if they have the high ground? What if they draw a gun? That's a lot of what ifs, but of course we tried the more sensible options. And what is more sensible than trying to run away? It's pretty difficult to capture this on camera, but we managed. A few times at least. The results were pretty clear though. Any time when the greatsword did the technique correctly at the right time, they would be able to keep up and gain ground. This is not strange, because running backwards is slower than running forwards, of course. Shortening the pike is possible in theory, but given the weight of both weapons, it's really quite difficult to recover your pike quickly, let alone shorten it at the same time. Shorten it while running backwards had pretty much the same issues, of course. And now the counter that I had really high hopes for. 
drawing a sidearm. And that was just so disappointing. Trying to draw the sword in time really wasn't that much of the problem. Um, I've got a good sword in a very historically accurate scabbard with a very smooth draw. And at the same time also put it on a position where it would be relatively easy to reach and even the person I'm training with generally isn't as fast as I am in this particular scenario. So that means that we really stacked all the different factors in favor of the pikeman drawing the sword in time to counter the greatsword. And it just never really worked. When we tried to run forward, we really didn't manage to draw the sword in time to do anything useful with it. When running backwards, we could draw the sword in time, but then what? Then you have a shorter sidearm against a really big heavy sword that's already in motion to vibe check you into next week. Wasn't really successful. We did have some luck with trying to run in for a grapple without going for the sidearm, but that was kind of hit or miss and it also got really messy. So that one we should probably revisit at a later time. Now, finally, what did we learn from sparring with the setup? A great way to pressure test your work is to try and make things work in sparring. And this is because quite often you will find whether the technique you're working on works, but you'll also find out in which situations it does. And you'll learn in which situations it doesn't. We found some pretty cool stuff about this in particular. For a lot of you this will already be quite obvious, but techniques are rarely ever meant to always work in any given situation. I would estimate that in this particular setup we could make it work around 50 to 60% of the time if we were doing actual free fencing as opposed to about 20% success rate that I tend to get with a one-handed sword against the spear. But what is most interesting here is when it was successful and when it wasn't. Because for both weapons I found that if you were the first to commit you would generally lose the exchange. If the pike committed to a thrust it was quite easy to pass the point and when that happened there really was very little the person with the pike could do. If the greatsword committed first it was very easy for the person with the pike to thrust while the greatsword was still recovering momentum. Although theoretically you could mitigate the missed strike by using the circling footwork from the simple rule, in practice committing at the wrong time usually meant just a lost exchange. This turned the sparring into a very cool game of bluff, where the winner of an exchange was usually determined by who managed to bait the other into committing to an attack. And this should not be strange, because when the 16th century fencing master Joachim Meyer talks about battlefield pikes, he says some very similar things about needing to make sure that the other commits to an attack so that you can counter successfully. So we can draw a couple of conclusions from this. First off, Figueredo's simple rule with the spinning footwork and the composite rule with the direct footwork both can work quite well if you get the timing right. But that doesn't mean, of course, that a greatsword is a better weapon than a pike. A pike is still a very potent weapon in a one versus one situation, especially against a shorter weapon. And Figueredo's rules are just a way to mitigate that reach disadvantage as much as you can. Such one versus one situations involving a pike were actually a lot more common than people seem to think, uh, especially because the most common type of engagement was not a pitched field battle, but rather smaller skirmishes and other such engagements where this kind of matchup that we see here, or some very similar ones, or two versus twos, were a lot more common than really large coordinated group actions. That said, I still think it would be pretty cool to show how pikes, greatswords and halberds would interact in a larger group context, but that's something for a future video, I think. For now, I hope I managed to plead my case well, but I think my work here is done. Time to go and have a nice sit down in the comfy chair, me thinks. That said, if you thought this video was fun and informative, do not forget to leave a like, subscribe and even leave a comment. And if you think this is stupid and would never work in a real fight, then also leave a comment because that boosts the algorithm too, I guess. And finally, a very serious thank you to all of my patrons because I really appreciate their support and it also really helps me in making these videos. So thank you very much. That said, I hope to all see you for the next one and until then, okay doing.